But hey, welcome to all of you across our campuses and those of you joining us online. Today we begin a brand new summer series, uh, which I'm excited to tell you about. But first, I want to show you a picture and tell you a story. Here's the image. This image on the left is my friend Dave and a young man named Dante, taken in 2005. The picture on the right is the same two men, Dave and Dante, taken this year at Royal Family Kids Camp. So there's 16, 13 years, excuse me, difference between the first picture on the left and the second picture on the right. Dante was an eight-year-old eight year boy when Dave first met him as his counselor at Royal Family Kids Camp. And this year, uh, he went back as a counselor to work with Dave. And I met with Dave, who was a good friend, part of our church uh, family, and a faithful servant at Royal Family for all these years. And Dave said to me, of all the things that he's been involved in, Royal Family Kids Camp is one of the best pictures of the church in action. And I could not agree more. They just got back from another week of a successful week at camp, as you see. And I just wanted to show you this image of people loving and serving faithfully for more than a decade. And to see Dante, a young man of the foster care system on the left, as an eight-year-old boy. And then as a grown man, 23 years old, to go back and to serve and to bless others that are in the situation that he was in. What a great picture of what the grace of God does and what the church is meant to do. So to all of you who have prayed for, given to, or served in Royal Family Kids Camp, thank you for that. And perhaps some of you watching this might be moved in your own spirit to get involved in some ministry like that and make a difference right where you are. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you for Dave and Dante two lives that you care deeply about, and by your grace and your spirit, you brought them together. And you're doing that in ways that we hardly grasp right in our midst and all over this world. Help us to have eyes to see and a heart to serve right where you give us the opportunity. Lord, we can't change all the problems of the world, but we can make a difference where you place us. So give us that kind of passion and desire. And now, Lord, open our minds and hearts to your word as we dig in, because we need to hear from you to understand who you are and who we are in light of your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, we're starting a brand new series on the New Testament letter, Revelation, the last book of the Bible. You'll see here a picture of these seven churches. Revelation is, uh, we, we don't often think about it this way, but Revelation is a letter written to seven specific churches in modern-day Turkey in Asia Minor. There they are rep represented on the map, and we're going to look at in this series the three, first three chapters of this letter, looking at g the specific instructions, challenges, and uh, commands to these churches then, and to see what they have to say to us today. But what I want to do as we start this series is give you a little um, background information and a little help in how to read Revelation because it's one of those books that is challenging for us in the 21st century. It's written by John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, who also wrote the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote Revelation while he was imprisoned on an island called Patmos by the, the, the Roman Empire. He received visions from an angel of God and was instructed to write these things down for the churches then and now. It's a letter that it's addressed to these seven churches, as I said, but the message is for all Christians at all times. The letter records a series of visions that John received. Now, when it comes to Revelation, there are those who are fascinated with it and obsessed with it for some of the wrong reasons, and there are many others who kind of avoid it because of those who are obsessed with it for the wrong reasons. Uh, it contains strange imagery. Uh, there, there are uh, those who kind of uh, just avoid it because it's confusing, because it's difficult, because it's you know, unsettling, quite frankly. The word revelation is a Greek word, apocalypsis. It's where we get our English word apocalypse from. Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word apocalypse. I can probably guess, though. For most of us, because of Hollywood and, uh, and the, our modern culture, we hear the word apocalypse and we think about things like, you know, a nuclear holocaust, the end of the world, or maybe a meteor striking the earth and ending all things, or a meteor shower and the world burning, or for many more recently, it's the zombie apocalypse. I don't know what our fascination is with zombies, but they're in every end of the world movie these days. Hollywood, in particular, uh, uh, some Christians have interpreted this book in a way that's filled our imaginations with images of fire, war, invasions, fear, terror. But is this really what the letter's about? Is it really just about the end of the world and how it's going to end terribly? 
Here's the thing. Even though the word apocalypse conjures up images of Mad Max or, or you know, uh, the Walking Dead, perhaps, that's not what the word means. The word means unveiling, uncovering, or revealing. The word apocalypse means something is being revealed. Something that we could not see because it was covered or veiled is now being unveiled and we can see more clearly. Like when you flip over a rock to see what's underneath. Or more specifically, when a curtain is pulled back. I want you to look at this image, and when you think of Revelation, this should be the image that comes to your mind. There's a curtain being pulled back, and we're being given a clear vision of something. That's what the word means. It doesn't mean the world's going to end in fire and blood and all the bad things. It means unveiling, uncovering, or revealing the curtain being pulled back. Remember the scene in The Wizard of Oz? When the curtains pull back, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It's as if God is giving John and us a peek behind the curtain at what's really going on. And even more than that, so we could say the goal of Revelation then is to help us see. If the word means unveiling, revealing, uncovering, then the goal is to help us see what is unveiled or uncovered. This is literally the first word of the book, the revelation, the apocalypsis, the unveiling. So what exactly does Revelation want to help us see? What's it trying to help us get a clearer picture of? You ask the average Christian today, and they'll say something like, well, it's helping us see the end times, the last days, the end of the world, the future, in other words. Most people, the popular opinion inside and outside the church is that Revelation is to help us see the future, to understand how it's all going to end. But is that accurate? Is that really what it's about? This is popularized by the Left Behind books and the movies by the same name and lots of movies throughout Christian history that uh, talk about the end of the world based on, loosely based on the book of Revelation. So I think it's natural that we would think, it's understandable anyway, that we would think that the Revelation is trying to help us see the future. And to be clear, the book of Revelation does have some very important things to say about the future and about the end of all history. But at a more basic level, Revelation has something more important to help us see. Popular author and pastor Brett Davis jokes about Revelation as a kind of spiritual, long-range weather forecast. He says this, Looking ahead a few thousand years, the extended forecast calls for a 100% chance of fire, hail, mixed with blood. Plan your weekend accordingly, because there's a strong possibility of a vast locust army swarming the earth, right? But don't worry, it's thousands of years from now, and most of you will be dead before that happens. All kidding aside, Revelation does have some things to say about the future, but it's trying to help us see something more important than the future. Let's look at the the first three verses of Revelation. The revelation, there's the word, apocalypsis, of Jesus Christ. What is Revelation trying to help us see? It's right there in the first sentence. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show it to his servants, the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Okay, friends, that's what Revelation is trying to help us see. In a word, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the, the phrase of is important because we think it's of it like it's about him, but it's also from him. So the revelation is the revealing of Jesus Christ by Jesus Christ. Jesus is revealing himself to us. And you might think, well, wait, don't we already see who he is in the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and throughout all of Scripture? Yes, of course we do see who he is in all of Scripture, specifically in the Gospels. But in the book of Revelation, we're getting a different look at who Jesus is in his power and his glory reigning on the throne. We're getting a look at who he is when he isn't Jesus of Nazareth in the flesh, who he is ultimately. And so it fills out the picture for us of who Jesus is. It's the revealing of him. Now, it's, so it's about him, and it's also from him. Now, notice also, John says something very important to us in this passage about the, what Scripture is given to us for. Look at what he says. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Even to all that he saw, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, 
And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. What is the word of God for? Why has God given us his word? What's the point of it? That we would read it, hear it, and keep it. That's what he's saying. God's word has not done its work in us unless we're reading it, hearing it, and keeping it with our lives. That's what it's given to us for. And John says, what's written in the word was first seen and heard before it was written down. The eyewitness testimony. The word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. John saw, John heard, John recorded so that we could read, hear, and keep the word of God. And that's true of all of scripture when we come to the Bible. We are reading, hearing, and keeping what has been seen, heard, and recorded for us. So in all our discussions about Revelation, if we lose sight of Jesus, then we lose sight of what is being revealed. Whatever else we're talking about in Revelation, if we're not talking about the revealing, the uncovering, the revealing of Jesus Christ, then we're not talking about what the book itself claims to show us, Jesus. Okay, but how are we supposed to read or interpret it? How do we do this exactly? How do we make sense of some of the strange symbols and imagery in Revelation? Well, first of all, we we have to keep in mind that we are people living in the 21st century modern, postmodern world. And this is a letter written originally to people living in the first century ancient world in the Roman Empire. There are cultural symbols and imagery, genres of literature that are somewhat lost to us that make sense to them, which we, even if our best efforts, are only going to grasp partially. That doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning for us today. It means there are some symbols that are not meant for, we're not meant to totally decode because we, don't under, we didn't live in that culture. Let me give you a contemporary example. Let's say that a thousand years from now, or two thousand years from now, archaeologists are digging in, uh, in this region, Chicagoland area, that looks very different probably than it does today, and they find a container with some documents in it. Maybe they're digital files, a thumb drive or something like that. And they look at these documents, and here's what they read. And, and I looked, and behold, I saw a great and powerful bull come upon the city by the lake. And the great bull was faster and sleeker and stronger than all others. The great bull could leap over all the other animals. And the great bull did bring upon the city by the lake three golden rings in three years. And then after a year of silence, the great bull did bring another three rings of diamonds in three years to the great city by the lake. And I looked, and behold, I saw a great multitude in the streets of the city paying homage to the great bull. And the number of the bull was 23. Right? Now, how many of you would know immediately what I'm talking about? Of course, you know what I'm talking about. In case you don't, I'm talking about Michael Jordan, 23, the great bull, and the Chicago Bulls, and their six NBA championships. I've messed around thinking about this with the Cubs, the Bears, but I chose the Bulls, right? For those of us who live through those, those years, we, we can't help but know what that means. But if you're 2,000 years from now, having no context, what are they talking about? A bull that can jump over other animals in, in, in these different rings? What is he talking about? So in a way, the people in the first century who understood apocalyptic literature as part of their Jewish heritage, understood the world of the first century, would have gotten the symbols in a way that are, is a bit lost to us. Okay, let me give you then four basic approaches to interpreting the book of Revelation that will help us as we move forward in this series. Number one, the preterist view. Not preterist, but preterist. The, this word, the word preterist literally means past. So it's specifically the preterist view it looks at the book of Revelation as having been almost entirely fulfilled in the past specifically with reference to 70 A.D. when the Romans marched on Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, that most of all that's contained in the book of Revelation with all of its powerful imagery has already happened under the Roman Empire in the first century A.D. The second view is the futurist view. This is the opposite end of the spectrum. The futurist view looks at Revelation as a kind of blueprint for the future events prior to the second coming of Jesus. It's a way of looking at all that's going to happen in the future and understanding what has to happen in sequence before Jesus comes. This is a view that's very familiar to many people who grew up in the church in America over the last several decades. The third historical view is the historicist view. This view looks at that Revelation begins in the first century A.D., 
But then it moves throughout history, sort of kind of a schematic for understanding the history of the church from the first century all the way until the end of the church. And the last view is the idealist view. This view looks at the book of Revelation saying, this is not a schematic of past, present, or future. It's a way of understanding what's always going on in the spiritual world uh, of, of times of struggle and conquest and victory and defeat and challenge uh, in the church all the time. So it's a, it's a symbolic way of understanding what's always happening with God's people in the world. Now, each of these four approaches has their, their finger on something important. But none of them, in and of themselves, get it 100% right. Let me give you a little drawing that might help us. And I realize some of you are going to like this because it's like going to, to a theology class, but stay with me. I hope this will help you when you read Revelation, both in this series and on your own. So at the bottom of this little chart, we're going to put a timeline, a very simple one. We're going to put past, present, and then, of course, future. And then on the vertical axis, we're going to put a way of interpreting. And at the top, we're going to call this a code. That revelation is a code to be uh, deciphered. So we'll put a little magnifying glass here. You're looking for the clues there in the code. And at the bottom, we're going to call it lenses. It's not a code to be deciphered here, but it's lenses through which to see. Two different ways of approaching the book of Revelation. Okay? Now, if we think about it this way, this little chart helps us know when I, when I talked about those ways of interpreting a moment ago, where would we place them? Well, so beginning with the preterist view would be a code for the past. That we're decoding the past. We're looking at all that's already happened. The futurist view would be decoding the future. Oops, I didn't spell that right, but you get the idea. The futurist view. Decoding what's going to happen in the future. The historicist view, moving from the past. Historicist, I can't even spell. And then the idealist view is dealing mostly with the present. So you get an idea where those things sort of fit. But let's talk about this for just a minute. Is the book of Revelation given to us to decode the past? If it is, then what's the purpose of it for us today? I mean, if, if all the things in Revelation have already been fulfilled thousands of years ago, then why read it? It's historically interesting, perhaps, but what good does it have to do for us if it's all already been fulfilled? On the other hand, if none of it's been fulfilled yet, if it's only a way to look into the future then what good was it for 2,000 years for those who read it in the first century? I mean, if, if the book of Revelation is given so that a few insightful code breakers could evaluate the times based on current events and predict the future, then it's kind of been a big fat fail for 2,000 years because they were obviously wrong when they read it because none of that, those things have happened yet. So it can't be just this or this. In general, I would put it this way. When we read the book of Revelation, we should be thinking about it in terms of lenses by which we see and not a code that we're trying to break, but a way of seeing the spiritual reality and what God's ultimate plan is and who ultimately is in control. So when you think of Revelation, think of a curtain being, being pulled back and lenses on by which to see Jesus and ultimate reality. All right, now let's go back to our outline for a minute. And let's talk about three keys to reading Revelation well. And then I'll give you a couple of examples that are just so amazing from the book of Revelation itself. Okay, three keys to reading Revelation well. First, it's of Jesus and from Jesus. Perhaps the word of, for of, we should think of the word about. It's about Jesus and from Jesus. Jesus revealing Jesus, in other words. Uh, of course, he's revealed in the Gospels, but he's more specifically revealed here in Revelation. Uh, here's what Brett Davis writes in his book I mentioned a moment ago. The book is called Seeing the Strange. No part of Revelation means to drive us to bullheaded predictions or overreaching analysis or ever-changing flowcharts. All of Revelation 
is meant to drive us to our knees in worship. So we only begin to understand Revelation well when we are on our knees worshiping the Lamb on the throne. If we're decoding and full of anxiety and fear, we're not reading it right. Second, it's for all Christians at all times. It's not just for those in the past. It's not just for us in the present or all those in the future. It has something to say to the church, God's people, in the world at all times and in all places and in every era of history. Yes, it's addressed to seven specific churches in the first century, but those churches are not only individual, specific, real churches at that time. They are also archetypal of what the church experiences and faces throughout history, what we're facing today. And what we're going to find as we go through this series is each of those seven churches, we're going to see ourselves in each of them in some way, shape, or form, us collectively, us individually. And we really need to hear what Jesus has to say to the churches back then and today. The church grew up in a world in which it was born into and grew up in a world in which it was hostile to the claims of Jesus Christ, where those who followed him and gathered together to worship him felt marginalized, felt pushed aside, felt persecuted even uh, for their beliefs. And where those who followed Jesus looked out at the world and thought, It's falling apart right before our very eyes. Many of us feel that way today. Revelation was given not to increase our fear and anxiety about present circumstances or about the future, but to bring us comfort and peace, to remind us of who ultimately is in control. This brings us to the third thing, location, location, location. That's what every real estate agent says, right? That's the most important thing, location. It also is very important when we come to the book of Revelation. We need to understand where we are when we're reading Revelation, where John is. So, for example, in the book of Revelation, when you are on the earth looking at events of the earth, it's kind of terrifying. There are bowls and seals and blood and river and fire and war and beasts and false prophets and dragons, and it's it's not good. And then, whoosh, John is taken away to heaven. Now, he's not on the earth anymore. He's in heaven in his vision. And he sees an image of the throne room. And there are angels singing and and people worshiping and multitudes. And there's a throne and there's a lamb on the throne who's reigning. And then back to earth. More fire, more blood, more fear, more anxiety. Things are looking really bad. And then whoosh, back to heaven. There's the lamb sitting on the throne. It's almost as if when looking at the earth, when we're at that location, we're about to question, who's in control? Who's running the show here? Who's, is anybody holding this thing together? And then John's taken away and reminded, oh yes, the lamb. The lamb is in control. He's still on the throne. And we need that reminder in our lives and in our culture. In fact, the contrast of these visions is meant to show us, this is more the idealist view, at all times, The church faces opposition. People begin to wonder who's in control, where is God, and we need the vision of the Lamb on the throne, and that's what it's given to us for. All right, let me look at a couple of specific examples that are just so beautiful and so powerful as we wrap this up. First, from Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 and 9 through 10. Now, I want you to pay attention to what John hears and what John sees, and how what he hears and what he sees are two perspectives of the same thing, all right? And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. The next few verses go on to list the tribes of Israel symbolically in 12,000 increments. So it's a, it's a symbolic number. By the way, numbers in Revelation are given to symbolize things more than actually count them. So John hears the number, And then in verse 9, after this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. First of all, what an image of the end of history. Every tribe, every nation, every ethnicity, every tongue coming together, unified in, for one reason, the Lamb who is on the throne. Singing in worship, salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. But this 144,000 and this great multitude that no one could number are the same thing. 
It's in the same passage. It's the church, the people of God throughout the world and throughout history, seen from two different perspectives. From 144,000, seen from God's perspective in heaven. The perfections, the perfected number of God's people brought in uh, for salvation. And then from earth's perspective, a great multitude you can't even count. All the people of all the tribes brought together. The same reality, God's people at the end of history coming before the throne to worship him. Now, one more passage. Revelation chapter 5, verses 4 through 9. Oh, this is so good. And so, so before this, John sees an image of these scrolls, and they're sealed, and he knows that these scrolls are important, and they have to be opened, particularly to reveal God's plan to restore all things. And he, no one can open the scroll, and John is deeply troubled by this because it's a symbolic meaning that no one can tell him how it's going to end. And I began to weep, John, loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, so he's hearing this, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So John hears this name, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain is the next word. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, set out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. There's the same image again, the same vision of every tribe, language, nation, and people coming together to worship God at the end because they were ransomed by the blood of the Lamb. Notice how John hears the name, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, sees the image of a land standing as though it's been slain, and realizes those two things, what I heard, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, what I saw, the Lamb, are the same person, Jesus, who ransomed us by his blood. Friends, we're going to dig into the first three chapters of Revelation. It's going to get very specific and have things to say to our hearts. But as we start, I just want you to have this in your minds. God has given us this amazing letter, full of its powerful and disturbing images, for one central reason, that we would do this, that we in our hearts, with all God's people everywhere, would be able to say, worthy are you, Jesus, for by your blood we were ransomed, and we worship you and you alone before your throne, now and for all of history. Let's pray together as we close. Father God, thank you for the way that you pour out your grace in our lives, and we, like those Christians so long ago, often feel like the world is falling apart. Sometimes our hearts are full of fear and anxiety. Sometimes we're indifferent and not paying attention at all. But God, whatever the case, we're asking that you would open our eyes, help us to see, give us the revealing, the uncovering, the unveiling, not just the, of the future, but more importantly, of you, Jesus, that we would see you more clearly. And by seeing you, we would know you and love you and follow you. Help us, as John said, to read, to hear, and to keep the revelation of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for worship today. I hope that you're blessed, especially to those of you fathers out there. We love you. We're grateful for you. And may your heavenly Father bless you as well. Let's close now in a benediction with the words from Revelation chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.